Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, once again to bring you the story behind another cancelled games console. We have looked at all sorts of these consoles on here in the past, from the Sega, Neptune and Pluto, to the Panasonic M2, to the Atari Panther, and even the Coleco Chameleon. Today on this channel, we are going to be talking about the Conix Multisystem, a cancelled games console from right here in the United Kingdom. To be honest, unlike the Coleco Chameleon, the Conix Multisystem is one console I wish was never cancelled, as I genuinely believe that had this amazing creation made its way to the market, it could have changed the face of modern gaming as we know it. The Conix Multisystem started to formulate all the way back in 1988. It was initially going to just be a peripheral design based off the back of the little Welsh company's success with their range of joysticks. The device was initially worked on under the code name Slipstream. The Multisystem appeared to look somewhat like a dashboard come controller, which could be customised with a steering wheel, a flight stick and motorbike handles. It was a feat which was going to be so impressive, it was even going to include the arcade delight known as false feedback, which at that point was pretty much unheard of within home gaming. Very impressive, eh? The company director, Wynne Holloway, however, had much bigger plans in mind. He turned to their sister company, Creative Devices, who specialised in computer hardware, with his own fantastic plan. He wanted to design the most impressive gaming system possible, with all the bells and whistles of the modern arcade gaming experience, to be played in a home environment. The point was to create a much more immersive and interactive way to play games in the home than what we'd ever seen before. Win and Connix as a company actually had no experience in the gaming market. Apart from their joysticks, they were complete novices. Yet, they had a dream and were lucky enough to stumble into the best possible team in an attempt to make this pipe dream a reality. It was around this time that he made connections to another little British group of developers, who we have discussed before on this channel, called Flair. Woo. Flair, fresh on the market after their separation from Sinclair Research, were out on the town looking for the new project to work on. These team members were extremely hot property, with success stories under their belts such as the ZX81 and the ZX Spectrum itself, and were out and about showing off their latest fantastic creation, the Flare 1, which I'll go into more detail about later. Now bringing the focus back to Win Holloway, this man seemed to have all sorts of ideas falling out of his bum bum. He had designs for hydraulic chairs, like what you had in the arcades for games like Outrun and Afterburner, but instead would have been a fraction of the cost to create. He also created a light gun with a recoil feature, which would have felt much more realistic than what was already available on the market. The steering wheel would also have controls which would feel like he was actually changing gears, and the flight stick was going to have a pivot which would be able to simulate pitch controls. Apparently the controller was even going to have a rumble feature, although this was never confirmed 100%. One of the main setbacks that Conix would suffer in their road to creation was that they hadn't developed any console previously. They were essentially an unknown quantity. This meant that the large game developers were not prepared to invest any time or effort into creating games for the platform as there was no way to tell whether they would get any return on their investment. I believe this is potentially one of the reasons this amazing console ended up being binned, as the games which were going to be available initially were mostly remakes of currently successful games on other platforms, or arcade titles which everyone had already heard of. The system was originally designed to use cartridges for their games, however in order to pull back on costs, the system was changed to be able to utilise the much cheaper floppy disks instead, which they'd be able to add proprietary copyright onto. The system was allegedly set to come to the market at £200, which was very reasonable with games apparently being set to have been released at around only £14 a pop which would have been much cheaper than many systems on the market in terms of their games. This would have actually made it quite affordable when you compare it to the competition and their proposed prices. Apart from the creator's lack of experience, 
there is quite a lot of speculation surrounding why this system didn't make it to the market. But it would seem the primary reason is that Konix simply ran out of money. It just seemed that it wasn't getting the media or public attention that is required, which in turn meant, as mentioned above, that the most reputable of developers were not prepared to invest their time. Other sources of investment were likewise reluctant to invest their money either. There was just too much riding on this and there was a lot to lose if it ended up being a flop. There also appeared that there were potentially some issues with Wynn Holloway himself. Despite being a very charming man who would be able to sell ice to a penguin, he had allegedly come across as somewhat greedy in that he wanted top money for everything involved with the system and wasn't prepared to allow much of the business to be split with other interested parties. One of the most famous possible allies he could have made was actually Lucasfilm, and when Holloway managed to scare them off. He had possibly the most exciting product to be able to bring to the market and was scaring off companies which he needed to essentially be his lifeblood to make his project a money-making reality. Other things to consider is that not all of the parts which would make the Konix multi-system were as revolutionary as one would have expected in the way it had been put forward initially. For example, the steering wheel wasn't actually anything new. In fact, most of the machines had been seen before. It was essentially just going to end up being a mishmash of lots of different machines all amalgamated into one machine, which would be set up in the home rather than being spread across multiple machines in an arcade. It wasn't actually bringing anything new to the table. The mishmash was actually the main selling point of the machine as well. To be fair, the only thing about this system, which was genuinely that impressive, was Flare 1. And this wasn't even something that Konix was going to be able to claim as their own victory. Flare 1 was based on technology from the ZX80, which had also been used in the ZX Spectrum and the ZX81, but actually also contained four custom chips, which made it just as powerful as the Amiga and the Atari ST. This system would have featured 128K of ROM, 128K of video RAM, which was later upgraded to 256K to meet the demands of the few developers who were on board, and 768K of system RAM. It also had the potential to provide 265 colours on the screen simultaneously. It could handle 3 million pixels and contained a chip which allowed for both horizontal and vertical scrolling. It was able to manoeuvre sprites over the screen much faster than the Atari ST, which would have struggled at this even with only 16 colours on the screen. As mentioned, they were planning on selling the multi-system for around £200, which was a very reasonable competitive price, considering the system's power. However, they lacked the resources to go into mass production, which was the reason they were looking to formulate a coalition with another company. As time moved on, Flare would have to further work on the Flare 1 to meet demands of developers, who would need it to be even more powerful. Now let's have a deeper look into the peripherals, which would have further contributed to the multi-system. Some of these are legit, and some of these are potentially hearsay, or didn't make it to the final design. But all are generally worth a mention. There was the power chair, which was basically a hydraulic power chair, much like what you found in the arcade but would have been compatible with some of the games. It does seem that this would have been a later addition had the multi-system made it to the market though. The light gun was quite a good shout, in that it could be used as a handgun or could be adapted into a rifle. Again, as one of Wins Holloway's crazy ideas, it had a recoil feature which would have made it feel much more like a real gun which would have preceded the rumble feature that Nintendo would develop for their light gun. Foot pedals were available to add, with a brake and an accelerator. However, despite the capability of using the controller to change gears, there wasn't a clutch feature, which would have made this stand out more from its arcade equivalents. Now, stepping into the realms of the ColecoVision, Acetronic and Intellivision, the system would have also included a number pad controller, no one likes the number pads, and I don't really get why this amazing piece of kit would have needed one, but oh well, it did. I suppose at least this was many years before the Atari Jaguar made the same mistake too with one of these strange controllers. For more basic games, a joystick was going to be included with the bundle. 
as was a keyboard which indicated the multi-system could be somewhat used as a home computer. Really? And for the last few bonkers editions, we would have had a skiing simulator, rowing machine and an exercise bike. Honestly, Wynne Holloway must have been one of those geniuses the world wasn't quite ready for. I bet Mr Holloway, with his peripheral fetish, would have loved the Nintendo Wii many years later. Whilst, as reported previously in this video, the system never made it to the market. However, in the world of the information superhighway, that never stopped an unreleased Conix multi-system game being exposed to the planet in 2012. The game was an unfinished Conic version of Attack of the Mutant Camels by British developer Jeff Minter, the man who gave Tempest 2000 to the world. The Conix multi-system was scheduled for release all the way back in 1990, so it is mind-boggling to think that no one got to sample the game all the way until another 22 years later in 2012. If you fancy trying this game out for yourself, you need to download an emulator known as Slipstream, which was the original development name for the multi-system. In the year of 1990, the release date for the platform shifted from May to August to October. A magazine known as The Games Machine reported on the scale of the problems the company was suffering. Apparently, employees of Conix's paychecks were bouncing and employees hadn't been paid, so software development quickly grinded to a halt as a result. Due to these issues, Conix sold the rights to their successful joystick range to Spectravision in an attempt to save their company. Joysticks previously had always been the goose that lay the golden eggs for Conix. So without that, the company had lost its main revenue stream. Ralph reportedly, there was a big demand for the system in terms of gamers who actually wanted to buy the upcoming product. Conix's lack of finances ultimately led to the system's demise. If only they could have just started a Kickstarter campaign to finance this mess. Eh, ladies and gentlemen? I'm sure that would have turned out great. Conspiracy theorists, including Holloway himself, claimed that other major international competitors threw spanners in the works in order to make sure his system never made it to the market. Apparently, these international competitors leaned on Conix's suppliers and finances to prevent the project reaching the market. This wouldn't be the first story we have heard about gaming companies playing it dirty during the 1980s. Whilst 1990, was the end for the Conix multi-system, Flare Technology on the other hand went to work on their new project the Flare 2, which was eventually procured by Atari, which formed the basis for the Atari Jaguar. So in a way, I guess the Conix multi-system is the Atari Jaguar's dad. The Flare 1 technology itself was purchased by Bellfruit, a gambling fruit machine manufacturer, which they went on to use in their quiz machines. Most interesting of all though, in regards to the legacy and influence of the Conix multi-system, is that the design itself was later released as a simple and inexpensive PC games controller, without obviously any of the special internal hardware included. This version of the device was released independently by a company from China, and the device was released as the MCS Super MS200E multi-system, which is a bit of a mouthful if I do so say myself. Or I say so myself if that, if that makes sense. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of the Conix Multisystem, a cancelled games console from my home of the United Kingdom. Which cancelled console would you like me to talk about in depth on this channel in the future? If you are new here and enjoyed this jolly video, do not forget to like, comment and subscribe. And most importantly of all, hit the notification bell to get obscure in-depth content like this straight to your phone every single week. Yeah! Finally, my channel Top Back Gaming Man is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Richard Clark, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bazansky, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology,
Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, and all of my other patrons. I would really struggle to make these videos without your kindness. If you too would like to support this fine channel, then make sure to check out my Patreon page. There's rewards too. Cheerio!